first of all, before you introduce the speaker, I'll introduce the introducer. Okay. And so uh, Kurt Kreutzer was the um, uh, PhD advisor for uh, Brian Catanzaro, and so he knows him very well. So please go ahead. Great. So it's it's such a pleasure to introduce your, your own graduates and see how well they've done. Uh, Brian's currently Vice President of Applied Deep Learning Research at NVIDIA. Um, he leads an applied deep learning research there where, and his team uh, uh, leads a, he leads a team solving problems in domains ranging from video games, systems design using deep learning. And he created CUDNN project, which is now quite literally used by millions of developers to train and deploy deep learning models. That's not an exaggeration and contributed to the creation of DLSS, which is the first neural reconstruction method for graphics rendering. He's contributed uh, truly, again, this is, this is the truth, uh, to research in all aspects of conversational AI from speech recognition, natural language processing to speech synthesis. Uh, he received his PhD in 2008, was it? 11. 2011, yeah. Time flies. Sure does. Yeah, thank, well, thank you, Kurt. Um, you know, it's it's uh, kind of a milestone for me to, to come back 10 years after I finished my PhD and and uh, meet with you on Zoom. I wish we were in person, um, but but uh, it's a it's a big honor and it feels a little bit like coming home. So so thanks thanks for giving me this chance. Um, I want to talk today about um, you know how we go about applying deep learning at Nvidia and tell you a few stories and talk about a few projects. Um, to kind of give, give you a sense of what it feels like to apply deep learning um, when your goal is to make the company better, to make our make the products stronger, to make the work more efficient, um, and uh, and so so hopefully we'll have we'll have some fun. Um, when I think about the work of applying deep learning, I usually break it down into four pieces, and the first one. Uh, uh, that I put this big overemphasized box uh, on is deep learning architecture, this question of like, what kinds of models are we gonna train? Now, um, why did I put that big block box on there saying overemphasized? I think, you know, uh, the, the question of like, what kinds of neural networks are we training? And, you know, uh, uh, how do we think about uh, the models themselves? I think is, is really uh, interesting, uh, especially to academic conferences um, and gets a lot of attention. So everybody kind of expects uh, when they hear, oh, you're applying deep learning that um, somehow, you know, the majority of the work is gonna be inventing new deep learning models. Um, and, you know, we do some of that, but I think it's overemphasized. And the stories that I'm gonna be telling today are gonna be focusing primarily on these other issues, um, which I think uh, most of the time dominate the question of deep learning architecture. And those are, the application concern. So how do we use deep learning in context of a problem we're trying to solve? What are the inputs to the model? What are the outputs? What is sort of the frame of the application around that model that's actually using it to do something? And um, as I'm gonna explain, you know, uh, this can have an enormous impact on the success of a deep learning application, um, you know, uh, even not, not sort of orthogonal to, to the model itself. Um, also data, you know, uh, I, I always think that uh, in a world of data driven algorithms uh, that we have with machine learning, modern, modern deep learning methods, that the data is truly part of the algorithm. Um, you know, we take a data set and we learn a model from it. And the things we learn from that data are actually what allow, allow us to solve problems, right? That's actually where we get the value in this model that we're deploying. And um, so what that means is that the process of constructing data sets is just as important as the process of inventing uh, a neural network. And uh, it's something that in pretty much every project that um, my team undertakes, uh, we, uh, we have to work a lot on the data and a pipeline actually for building data because it's, it's, it's never, it, you know, building data is never a, a completed, uh, project, right? It's always a, an iterative project where we, we improve our data, uh, we increase it, we clean it, um, then we train some models, we learn some more things about the data, we, we, we then augment the data set, um, and we continue to iterate. So it's really about building a pipeline that allows us to continuously iterate on a data set. Um, it's like really core to, to the um, process of deploying deep learning. 
And then, um, you know, finally, not but not least, is uh, systems concerns. So, how do we train on huge data sets, and how do we train enormous models? How do we deploy them um, given real time constraints? And you know, it's it's interesting because um, uh, I feel like systems concerns, in some way, this is this is how I got to deep learning. You know, back when I was a a grad student at Berkeley, um, I was part of the PAR lab, um, which, you know, uh, this happened a long time ago, so probably most of you uh, don't know about the PAR lab, but, but it was exciting at the time we were thinking about, like, what is parallel computing going to do for the world and how are we going to make parallel computing successful? And as a, as a, a grad student, I was trying to figure out, like, what kinds of um, applications were going to be enabled by um, parallel computing, and I felt like um, machine learning was going to be uh, probably one of the most important, and, and that kind of, you know, um, pushed me in, in in the direction that that I ended up going in. Um, but there's always been this strong link between systems work, like you know, that the Par Lab was primarily concerned with, and uh, machine learning itself. Um, but it it's often overlooked. I remember when I when I went to ICML uh, to present my first paper, uh, you know, and it was on, um, uh, uh, you know training support vector machines on on gpus back in 2008 um, there was like back then at icml every paper was about a new algorithm that somebody had invented that would run on their laptop and um when i when i came in and i said well i think we need to be training these systems on parallel computers like gpus and you know we can get a lot bigger scale and train a lot faster you know people really looked at me like uh, like i was a they were surprised, like, why are you here at, at our conference? We're, we're a machine learning conference. We don't do systems work. You know, um, you know, why, why did you come to, to ICML? Um, you know, so there's, there's been this, like, you know, I feel like resistance to systems work somehow in, in um, machine learning. At the same time, you know, many uh, important advances in machine learning have been accompanied by systems work. And, you know, I, I think one of the best examples of that is, um, you know, Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sutskever's work uh, uh, on the original AlexNet model for ImageNet training, right? That, of course, in 2012 really kicked off the deep learning revolution. And, um, you know, Alex and Ilya, they spent a long time writing CUDA kernels so that they could train their ConvNet on a GPU. And, you know, that really allowed them to train a bigger ConvNet than people had done before and uh, kicked off the deep learning revolution. So I feel like um, you know the the, the systems work. Uh, it's really important, and it's you know uh, it, it it takes a, a an enormous amount of our attention, especially at Nvidia, which is a systems company, uh, in a lot of ways. Now, one of the interesting things as well about that at Nvidia is that a lot of the systems that we deploy have really stringent real time constraints, and uh, you know we're we're often using deep learning to actually make something go faster. You know, I would say, you know, um, the modern deep learning uh, applications revolution started at places like Google with, you know, billions of, of web users and, you know, collecting click streams and turning those into recommender systems and so forth and, and you know, search and, and these, these sorts of things where, where the goal was essentially to provide more accurate results because that transformed into, into value for the business. You know, for uh, NVIDIA, we often have problems where the value comes from speed. You know, uh, we, we want to provide uh, an experience that's actually faster. Uh, and so that's interesting, right? Like, how do we use deep learning to make something go faster? Well, uh, deep learning, if, if we're going to do that, needs to actually go fast itself. And so there's some interesting systems problems in deployment as well that, that sort of all wrap up together. OK, so, so that's kind of my, uh, my like sort of broad overarching um, description of the different kinds of work that we do when we're applying deep learning. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, a bunch of different examples that I think are, are kind of interesting. The first one I'm going to talk about is DLSS. And um, DLSS stands for Deep Learning Super Sampling. Um, and uh, it's kind of motivated by this observation that NVIDIA is making custom processors for artificial intelligence. Um, and we have these tensor cores in our GPUs, and we're pushing them out all over the world so that everyone uh, with, a, with a GPU uh, modern NVIDIA GPU made, you know, since since 2018, basically, um, has the the capabilities to do some really interesting deep learning at home, in real time, you know, on their own machine without needing to go to a server somewhere. Uh, so then this question is, well, what are we going to do with that? How is that going to actually provide value to, let's say, uh, a video game enthusiast, a teenager playing in the basement, right? Like, 
why do they need AI? Like, what are they going to do with it? And uh, DLSS is, is one answer to that question that you know I'm pretty proud of. Uh, so what, is, what does DLSS do? Um, well, it's a video reconstruction method where we're going to render a, uh, a 3D environment, a video game or a design application. We're going to render it sparsely, so with fewer samples, and then we're going to reconstruct it uh, to provide a video that we actually show. And because we're rendering sparsely, the rendering process is faster. So what we're going to hope is that the resulting video that we create has better image quality because we're doing a more advanced reconstruction, even though it is being built out of much fewer samples, so it's running faster. Uh, and of course, this uh, benefit is only uh, apparent if the cost, the, the time cost of running the neural network is fast enough so that it doesn't sort of outweigh the um, time that was saved with the sparse rendering. Um, so, so it's an interesting uh, problem from the system's point of view as well. Um, so DLSS uh, 2.0, uh, you know, I think it's it, it's now in about 50 games and it's been pretty well received. And and um, these are the properties that have have made it successful. Uh, firstly, it has great image quality. Um, the detail and the images that it produces is really um, really fine, and and it rivals dense rendering, even though it's being done sparsely. Um, Secondly, we have um, a pretty high upscaling ratio, so the, the sparsity ratio is, is pretty high. Uh, we have, um, you know, our performance mode is running at a 4x upsampling, so that means um, if we're outputting a 4K uh, uh, video, then the input is being rendered at, at 1080p. So we're reducing the number of pixels that have to be rendered in the traditional way by a factor of four. Um, we also have a, a mode uh, that's really good for extraordinarily high resolution displays like 8k displays uh, that actually does 9x upscaling um, and you know still gets you know really good um, detail um, especially at, at high resolution output um, so that that high upscaling ratio is really important um, uh, we have a generalized model um, so this is one model to rule them all what i mean by that is like um, for every game uh, for every resolution for every gpu uh, we just have one model, uh, and that makes it a lot. That makes it possible to deploy. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then finally, the systems aspect. So you know, we worked really hard on the um, uh, on the execution of this neural net, um, and it runs at 960 microseconds right now on our highest end GPU to produce a 4K output. So um, you know, when you're rendering a video game, if you're rendering at 60 frames per second, you have um, you have 16 milliseconds to do the work, so we're spending one millisecond to do the reconstruction, uh, and that that really um, is is fast enough that that we get a lot of benefit. Okay, so the story um, I, I didn't put the story in the slides, but I but I wanted to tell you a story about about DLSS 1.0. So I've been telling you about DLSS 2.0 and has how it has all these great properties. Well, it turns out um, in in 2018 uh, when we first started launching uh, GPUs with AI processors uh, for the mass market. Uh, we also launched it with DLSS 1.0. And um, DLSS 1.0 uh, was you know, really the first neural reconstruction method uh, to do this kind of thing for real-time graphics. And, um, and uh, you know, it, was a, it was a brave product. It was a challenged product. It didn't work super well. In fact, if you go on the internet and search um, for people complaining about all four of these different things that I have on the slide. They're going to complain about the image quality because although it was being rendered sparsely, it looked blurry. The output looked blurry and people didn't like that. They are going to complain about the upscaling ratio in sort of a, a, a tangential way. Um, the, the reason that, that uh, uh, people complain about it is that DLSS 1.0 just didn't provide a big performance benefit. Um, and one of the reasons was that it couldn't it couldn't really deal with high upscaling ratios. The sparsity wasn't high enough to provide enough benefit. Um, it wasn't a generalized model. DLSS 1.0 had to be trained for every game. And if you think about what that means, that means that for every game we had to create a custom data pipeline that would capture input and output frames because this is being trained in a supervised way. Uh, and those that needs to be deterministic because if you try to train a neural network to do reconstruction, but all of the sparks and little pieces of dust and you know uh, cloth waving in the breeze and so forth are in different places in your high resolution uh, output versus your low resolution input, 
then the, the network is not going to be able to learn how to do this reconstruction. You know, it's a standard garbage in, garbage out problem with neural networks. And um, making games deterministic is actually extraordinarily difficult because the physics engines that simulate uh, the, the universe in, in video games are not designed for determinism, right? So like having to go through every single game and try to figure out how to make it deterministic so that we could capture a custom training set for every game because we didn't have a generalized model uh, was, was really prohibitive. And that meant that very few games actually got DLSS 1.0. And then finally, um, DLSS 1.0 took about three times longer than DLSS 2.0 to run. And what that meant is that um, on some GPUs at some settings, it would actually slow things down because the cost of doing the reconstruction was so high uh, that you would actually get a slowdown. So your images would look worse. You would get a slowdown. It didn't even work in, in many games because of all these problems. Now, um, so, so um, how did we get from DLSS 1.0 to DLSS 2.0? Well, the interesting thing uh, that, that I wanted to highlight for all of you is that the neural network itself is basically the same. It's basically the same neural network. Um, so how did we solve all of these problems? Well, we reinvented all of the other things around it. So it has a completely different data pipeline, a completely different data strategy where we built a fully synthetic data pipeline. Uh, so it's being trained on 100% synthetic data. We don't need any data from any real game to train the model. And that made it generalized so we didn't have to build a custom pipeline for every game. And we could just use the same model for all games. So it's much, much easier to integrate. Um, we also uh, you know, changed the, the sort of purpose of the neural network. We changed the application framing. You know, What are the inputs to the network? What are the outputs to the network? So that we, we, we made the task easier to learn for the neural network. And uh, that allowed us to increase the upscaling ratio, increase the sparsity, which then increased the benefits of it, um, and also made uh, the image quality better. So we were able to preserve more detail. And then finally, we worked really hard on the systems aspect of it. Um, and you know, we're able to come up with a lot of clever solutions for the runtime that, that um, made, it, made it so much faster uh, to run that, that you know, we started seeing benefit everywhere. OK, so. Um, a little bit more about DLSS 2.0. Um, you know, one of the reasons that it's it's so useful is that ray tracing uh, is, it, it, you know, we're we're really big into ray tracing at NVIDIA. It's extraordinarily computationally intensive, so we're building this future of ray traced video games. Um, but you know, we, nobody can afford to actually uh, render everything densely for every pixel, and so um, uh, so so we need we need something to make it faster and and. At the same time, we have AI processors, so let's try to use them. So when we're when we're training uh, DLSS, we have the input, uh, we have a low resolution input, and then we have a, a high resolution output, and then our ground truth is an extraordinarily high uh, resolution um, ground truth. So so four megapixel input, eight megapixel output. Let's say we're doing a four x upsampling, so we go from four to eight megapixels, but then we're going to compare against one hundred and twenty eight megapixel. Um, output that we render offline so that our model can learn how to reconstruct things um, at, at really, really fine detail and, and you know, have perfect anti-aliasing. Uh, and then we train the network uh, in the supervised way to, to do this reconstruction. Um, it, it turns out that um, because we're using deep learning to do this, we can do much better um, uh, for the, this reconstruction heuristic than uh, what, what, standard, what the standard reconstruction methods do. Um, you know, the DLSS 2.0 is a multi-frame reconstruction, so it uses samples from multiple frames, and you can kind of see that in this graph. Um, let's say we, say we have two frames, um, the, the, um, uh, the previous frame uh, in orange, uh, the blue frame is the ground truth. And, um, you know, uh, we have these samples that are coming in, but due to aliasing, you know, we, if, if we weren't using deep, deep learning, we might have to resort, resort to some heuristics like clamping which would take the red samples and clamp them up near the green samples um, in, order, in order to avoid um, some like really bad aliasing problems. And um, so the standard non-deep learning methods for re uh, reconstructing signals like this, um, you know, they, they're, they're limited in what they can do. But our, uh, our deep learning model is able to actually use the samples as they come in, which then allows us to recover more detail in the reconstruction than we would get otherwise. Um, here's an example from a game called Death Stranding that came out um, last year. And um, on the left is a native a crop of a native 4K rendering. 
Uh, on the right is the output of, of DLSS. And if you look, um, there's some interesting things you can see already in the fences in the center of the image. There's some Moiré patterns happening in the native image uh, that are not happening in DLSS. And that's crazy because remember, DLSS is getting far fewer samples, right? So Moiré happens when you have an undersampling problem. Um, how, how is it that DLSS is resolving those fine details better, even though it has far fewer samples? Well, the answer is because we, we, we have a much better reconstruction function, we're able to use samples from prior frames more intelligently because we have a, a model that's learned how to do that. Um, and then if we zoom in a little bit, you can see we're actually reconstructing the fine detail uh, uh, better than, than the, the traditional rendering techniques. We actually have more true detail, and that, again, is a, a function of the reconstruction. At the same time, the frame rate is higher. So on the left, we're at 108 frames per second. On the right, we're at 141 frames per second. So we've got a nice frame rate boost, and our image quality looks better, which, you know, usually in graphics, you don't get both those things at the same time. Um, so, you know, we're really proud about DLSS. It's deployed in a lot of games and it's rolling out um, really fast uh, these days. Um, it's gotten great reviews uh, now that now that we moved on to this um, DLSS 2 version. Um, but again, you know, the interesting thing, you know, the, the neural network from DLSS 1.0 to 2.0 is, is essentially identical. The, the difference is training data in, you know, the, the application framing, like what's the neural network, what's the task the neural network is being asked to do. Um, and, and then the systems work of, you know, how do we deploy this as, uh, so that, so that we, can, we can run the biggest neural network um, in the shortest amount of time. Um, so that's, that's been a really exciting thing. You know, NVIDIA's business, um, its gaming business is, is still very important. Yeah. And, um, you know, the way that we compete is by having a GPU that's faster than the competitor at the same price. And so if you have a magic performance button that just makes your GPU um, seem bigger, then that's incredibly valuable. And it's, it's been, you know, a really exciting project for us. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're really excited about the future. I think there's a lot of opportunities to take a lot of graphics and turn them into AI, a lot of real-time graphics, and, and we'll see where we get with that. Okay, now I wanted to talk about um, another project that's really about making, you know, making something go faster using deep learning. Um, and uh, it, it's actually um, a, a project about kernel selection heuristics. So um, when you go to train a neural network on a GPU, uh, anytime you run a matrix multiply or a convolution function, there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of different kernels that the library can choose from in order to implement that particular computation. And, you know, these are the reason why there's so many is because there's, uh, there's a lot of different parameters that you can stride across like block sizes and tile sizes and, um, and like data layouts and, and so forth. And, and, um, uh, also, there's uh, split K variants. So, you know, um, if you think about MN and K, K is the sort of inner dimension of a matrix multiply. Um, if you want to increase parallelism because there's just not enough parallelism to fill the GPU, you might want to uh, cut the accumulations in that inner dimension up and parallelize across that. But then that requires a reduction, right? So that you, you need to, to, you have these partial sums that are completed in parallel. And now you need to reduce them to, to, to build the, uh, answer. And so um, there's a lot of different choices. There's a lot of different code that you could choose to run. Which one are you going to choose? And so, um, you know, our, our libraries for neural networks have had heuristics that choose between the hundreds or thousands of implementations that are sitting in the library. Um, but it turns out we can do a lot better by training a neural network uh, to choose the kernel. And um, so this, uh, this is actually a really interesting problem because you, we don't have very much time, right? Like the execution of a um, matrix multiply might only take a microsecond. Uh, and so uh, we want to have a heuristic that generalizes well because that's going to give people an overall performance boost for their application and again, make the GPU faster and, and more valuable to them. Uh, but we don't have a lot of time to choose because uh, you know, we, need, we, we need to get the show on the road here. Uh, and so, uh, so we built this heuristic um, and basically the way it works is that, you know, the, the problem is described like, for example, for a for matrix multiply, we have MN and K and maybe some other things. And that goes into a candidate kernel generator that, that can deterministically picked, pick which kernels could potentially be useful. Um, and then, you know, we, we sort of do a GPU specific feature augmentation based on the microarchitecture of the GPU that is sort of describing to the neural network 
um, features of that GPU that might be salient to making the decision about which uh, implementation to use. And then we feed that into a neural network that then produces a, a ranked list uh, of kernels that, that we could try. Um, meanwhile, of course, there's a cache, right? So um, if, if something is in the cache, it might be in the cache because it's an extraordinarily important neural network and we've done exhaustive auto-tuning and we just want to hit uh, hit that kernel uh, directly, or it might be in the cache because you know we've seen it before during training and we're maintaining a little bit of a cache about what uh, kernels to run, then uh, we, we can just use that instead. Um, so, uh, uh, so this has been kind of a fun project. Now, again, the neural network here is not interesting. There's no way that we could. Have, in fact, it's it's basically just a, a multi-level perceptron. Uh, there's 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 essentially no innovation in the neural network architecture at all. However, the um, application framing about what are the inputs and what are the outputs of this neural network, we went through a lot of different iterations to find something that that worked here. And the data pipeline, you know, so building the training data for this is actually a really interesting problem because we've got a lot of different kinds of GPUs, we've got a lot of kernels. And we've got a lot in this parameter space. You know, if you if you try to densely sample the parameter space, uh, you're going to spend an infinite amount of time just like benchmarking kernels, right? To to come up with uh, timings, and um, so we can't do that. So the 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 choice of sampling strategy um, that's really important. The the choice of um, you know uh, what are the inputs and outputs of this neural network is really important. Um, and uh, you know so. Results. I've I've had to you know remove some details because some of this is a little proprietary. But um, you know we get uh, these are the three graphs are different kinds of neural networks that you know we've seen uh, people running on GPUs, uh, and um, you know we're getting speed ups from 1.0, which basically means uh, we didn't slow it down, which is good. Most of the time we don't slow it down, up to um, 5x uh, for things that you know are, are really a little bit off the beaten path, like people running with weird batch sizes or are running models that uh, maybe haven't been as highly studied um, by our libraries. Um, so, so um, you know, we we get a fairly decent um, spread of, of of speed ups from this, um, and um, you know, it's been integrated into Kublas, which is our library for matrix multiply, and and we see on average about a twenty percent speed up for real life uh, workloads, which you know I'm super proud of, right? Like if if you think about all the GPUs in the world. Um, all of them are like running full tilt all the time because everybody is compute constrained. You know, giving the world essentially 20% more GPU capacity just by having a little heuristic uh, to choose the right kernel, I think, is is really valuable. And um, it's it's also in the final um, integration stages for QDNN, uh, which is our our neural network library um, for for doing convolutions. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm really proud of that. That you know, with with a little bit of um, Machine learning, we've been able to make GPUs uh, just that much more efficient. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk about uh, uh, speech synthesis for a little bit. Um, I'm really excited about flow based generative models. Um, some of you may already know this, but I'm just going to give a, a little mini tutorial here. Um, in a flow based generative model, uh, what we're trying to do is sample from some unknown distribution. And that could be um, you know, a very highly dimensional distribution. For example, uh, X, the, the sample space could be like a, a, a picture, right? It could be a, a million dimensional vector that describes the pixels of an image of people's faces. Um, now we know that there's a lot of correlations between all of those dimensions, right? Because that's what makes a face have structure is that there's correlation, you know, things, things uh, have relationships to each other, that's correlation. Uh, but actually describing that correlation is essentially impossible because um, it's, it's, it's very complicated uh, to describe exactly how the, the pixel values relate to each other in order to create a legible face. Um, so uh, we would love to be able to, to uh, just sample from the distribution of, of faces, uh, for example, but uh, it, it's, it's very hard because we don't know what that distribution is. And so the way that, that flow-based models work is um, we kind of, uh, we turn the problem inside out with an invertible model and, um, and, and, uh, and then transform it into something that we do know how to optimize for. And the idea is that during training, we're going to take uh, samples from our distribution, maybe the distribution of faces. We're going to run them through a, a neural network where we're training it to produce a very simple distribution, like, for example, um, white Gaussian, you know, uncorrelated 
Gaussian uh, random variables. And then uh, uh, if we can train an invertible network to do this, to go from our, our unknown distribution to a very simple known distribution, then at inference time, uh, we can turn it inside out uh, if the network is invertible and we can sample from a Gaussian and then convert that Gaussian into a sample from our, our distribution that we're trying to learn. And all of this can be done just with, um, you know, basically a simple change of, of variables while we're training it. Um, so that's that's kind of a cool trick, but I didn't I didn't really explain like how a neural network can be constrained to be mathematically invertible, and that's that's uh, that's kind of an interesting trick. Um, there's a, there's a few ways. Uh, one of the ways uh, that I thought was particularly easy to understand is from this Glow paper from from OpenAI, and again, this is building on work from a lot of people, but um, I think this was this was one that caught caught our attention. Um, you, you basically construct the neural network out of two stages. The first stage is an affine coupling layer that has an arbitrary neural network in it, but it only operates on half the channels to the input of the neural network. Uh, and, and so what you do is you take that half, you stick it through the neural network and have it compute a scale and a, a bias um, for every entry that then you apply to the other half of the channels. Okay, so in this diagram, XA goes in to the neural network, which is not invertible. It computes some scale factors and some biases that then we apply to XB, which is the other half of the inputs to produce some other XB prime that's been transformed by this non-invertible network. But uh, we pass XA, the inputs to that non-invertible network, we pass them through unchanged. So the output, those channels that, that were used in the non-invertible neural network uh, go through unchanged. And what this means is that we can then uh, reverse it because uh, when we need to go backwards, we can take XA, we can run it through the neural network and compute the affine constants. And you know, assuming that we don't divide by zero, which of course we're gonna make sure that we don't divide by zero because when we train it, we're gonna penalize the network for trying to divide by zero. Then we can recover XB from XB prime. Uh, and that allows us to go uh, to turn the neural network inside out, even though the, the, the neural network is built out of components that are not invertible. Now, um, the, the problem with only using an affine coupling layer is that the channels have been arbitrarily uh, restricted, right? So XA didn't get changed, right? Well, we, would, we need to be able to change all the channels, right? Not just some of them. And so, um, so to mix information between channels, uh, we use an invertible one-by-one -one convolution that's basically just convolving across the, the channels for each point. And um, we can constrain that to be invertible by, you know, basically paying attention to the determinant of, um, of the weights in that convolution. Um, and so, so we can constrain, we can constrain uh, that fraction, that, that sec second section of the neural network to be invertible as well. Um, and so uh, what can we do with that? Well, for speech synthesis, actually, it turns out that, um, uh, that we, can, we can do some interesting things. And, um, we've been working on this project called Flowtron. Uh, it's being presented at ICLR this year, uh, which is a generative model that learns um, an invertible mapping from speech data uh, to a latent space that we can then um, actually also use to, to modulate non-textual aspects of speech synthesis. Um, and basically the way that works is, um, uh, you know, if we take different speech samples, maybe they're from different speakers or they have different characteristics like different um, you know, tension in the voice or, or, or echo, different kinds of echo um, or different emotional characteristics. If we, it turns out that if we run those samples through our invertible model into our latent space, our simple Gaussian space, um, we find that they're often clustered in the latent space. So in this graph here, uh, zero, one, and two represent different speakers. And you can kind of see that, uh, you know, with this TSNE projection that, um, they, they end up in, in different clusters, which then allows us uh, in inference time to sample from uh, that cluster. So instead of sampling from a random Gaussian, we can sample from a, a much more restricted distribution uh, that we have chosen based on properties of sound that we would like uh, to incorporate in our speech synthesis. And that allows us to control a lot of non-textual aspects of speech synthesis. Um, so I made, I made a, little, uh, a little thing. Let's see if you can hear it. Go Bears and follow Jitendra's advice. You can come here and learn from us, or you can go to other universities and learn from our students. Go Bears! <laughs> there we go. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard Jitendra say that, but uh, he, he used to say that sometimes. 
Um, and, you know, when you listen to that, hopefully you can hear that there's a lot of, um, you know, non, non-textual sort of um, emotion that, that uh, was coming across. And, you know, that's what, what the dream is, a speech synthesis, right, is not just to convey intelligible speech, but to actually convey the emotions that, you know, we want in a, in a particular setting. Um, we have been using this in a variety of contexts, including um, our IMAI videos. Um, I'll play a fragment of our IMAI video from last year that was narrated by our Flowtron model. And, um, you know, this year, uh, so next week, actually, Jensen is, uh, Jensen Wong, our, our CEO, is going to be giving uh, his keynote. And there's going to be some, some new IMAI videos that are, that are narrated by Flowtron. I, I think they're pretty fantastic. But, um, you know, next week is next week. So this week, we're going to listen to a, a fragment of, of last year's. And you can hear um, you know, how this speech, how realistic the speech sounds. And again, the reason we were able to achieve that is because uh, we were able to sample um, from, you know, this latent distribution and control uh, the non-textual properties of synthesis that way. I am an explorer. Searching for the origins of our universe. And charting a safer path to other worlds. There we go. So, um, you know, ho hopefully you could feel like the, the different kinds of inflections and emotions that, uh, you know, the producers of that video were striving for. And, you know, the reason they were able to achieve that is, is because of this this fun algorithm that, that we worked on. So we do, we do work on algorithms and sometimes algorithms give us uh, benefits when we're trying to deploy deep learning. Uh, and Flowtron is one example of that. Okay, I wanna talk uh, about another interesting problem, uh, which is uh, chip design. So, you know, uh, uh, Kurt actually, um, you know, he used to be the CTO of Synopsys, which is a, a company that builds awesome tools for chip design. And, and um, so this, this kind of problem has been near and dear to my heart for a long time. And, you know, it's a really interesting thing to think about the end of Moore's law and how uh, the, the um, uh, ability to use the transistors that we are given from modern semiconductor manufacturing is going to have, I think, an increased differentiating factor because, um, uh, you know, basically the, the, the strength of the tool is going to be more important in an environment where we can't just take a design and print it with smaller transistors and get big business benefits. You know, we, we have to be we have to be smarter about how we use uh, the substrates that we're given, and and you know the fact that we have deep learning uh, and it's it's um, so useful gives us new tools. And so so here's uh, kind of an interesting project that we did recently that's being published this year at DAC. Um, and it's about prefix circuits, which you know are things like adders and recoders. Um, we use them a lot inside of um, our GPUs because we have lots of arithmetic circuits in the GPU and um, we would like to make them as low power and as cheap as possible. Um, and uh, so um, there's usually when you're building a circuit like this, there's a, a Pareto curve when you're trading off area with delay. And, um, you know, sort of the, the dream is, well, you know, we have tools, EDA tools like the one Synopsys makes that are very general purpose and are built with a lot of heuristics, we would like to uh, do something better uh, by using reinforcement learning. And um, hopefully reinforcement learning can be more specialized because it can take advantage of kind of the properties of the specific cell libraries that we're using, the specific process that we're using to build something that's more optimized and smaller and faster than what we could get with a, a standard heuristic. And that could uh, allow us to save uh, area at the same delay point um, or, or vice versa. So that, that's kind of the, the goal that we'd like to, to achieve. Um, okay, so how do we think about this problem? Well, prefix graphs, you know, you can think about them uh, in terms of uh, sort of the, the standard uh, slowest graph that you can imagine, which is a ripple carry graph, which is what I just showed you. Um, it's very sequential, which means it's very small. Um, uh, we, we would probably like to do some of it in parallel, right? We, we'd like to do some of the adding in parallel, and there's a lot of different structures to do that. Um, they're going to cost area. And there's a lot of different choices about how to do that. Um, and so that's what we'd like to do is train a reinforcement learning agent to design these um, prefix circuits. Um, 
And it turns out in the real world, you know, things are, are more complicated because really what we do is we take a design and synthesize it using a tool uh, and, you know, place and route it. And so, so we learn about the properties of that design um, through this long and complicated process. Um, and uh, each design actually has a diff its own area delay curve because they can be made at different sizes that have different delays. Um, and so what we'd really like to do is find like a Pareto optimal set of designs. Um, then, then we can, you know, just always have the best prefix our prefix circuit, no matter what um, area or delay constraint we're interested in. The state space is pretty big. So if we have just a four bit recoder, then, you know, there's about eight different uh, choices. So not very many, but if we have a 64 bit space, then it's about like, you know, two to the 2000. So, um, you know, it, there's just very many different choices, most of which are bad. Um, so, so how do we navigate that? Well, um, we, we built an action space that's um, restricted. So we think about uh, the problem of designing uh, an adder in terms of adding or removing nodes from, uh, uh, from the circuit. And then we're going to iteratively refine that. Um, and that's, that's the, the goal of the agent is to learn how to take a step to iter iteratively refine the design of each adder. Um, we, we use a really simple representation. Uh, it's built out of um, grids. Uh, basically, the, the lower triangle of this grid is, is valid. Um, and we're going to make sure that every adder we build is valid. So after every move, we're going to legalize the adder, make sure that it's a real adder. And then we're going to send it through um, uh, synthesis, place and route, and figure out um, you know, how well we did. Uh, so that's kind of the, the reinforcement learning setup. We're using Q-learning. Um, uh, and you know, so, so at every step, the model is going to modify the design. And then we're going to compare the two designs. The design before we took the step, we get area and delay. Uh, and then design after the, we took the step. And then we, we have a different area and delay. And then we use that to get a reward uh, that, that we use to train, uh, train the, the, the uh, agent. Um, the so these are two examples of different adders that were built by the system. They're kind of weird. You know, they're not the, they're not super regular. They're not the kind of thing that you know a human might just uh, design by algorithm. Uh, and you know, basically, they've been able to take advantage of some of the specific properties of the cell library and and the synthesis tools that that we're using in order to get something a little bit better. Um, and uh, uh, so, so here's, I guess, the, the results. Um, so this is comparing um, uh, our, um, oh, uh, sorry, I got the labels, the labels wrong on this graph. Um, so the black is actually um, the results from our, our reinforcement learning um, setup, and the blue is a, is a commercial tool for building adders. And so you can see that we're Pareto optimal at any point, you know, we have, uh, at any point area, we have better delay than what you get with a, um, commercial tool. And um, so that's great because, you know, we've been able to improve basically all of the different adders that we, we, we might want to build. And, um, you know, it gives me great joy uh, that circuits that we've designed using uh, this agent have been integrated into future chips that NVIDIA is building. Um, and, you know, that's, that's always, I think, the joy of working on applied research is, is when you get to see people actually using your work. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time here. Um, uh, we've done a lot of work in conditional generative models um, using GANs. This is this is something called um, GoGAN. Uh, uh, we're, we trained a model to go from semantic maps of landscapes to um, uh, uh, actual landscapes. This is you know built uh, you know following some work from Alyosha Efros and his team with Fix to Fix that that came out a while back, and we kind of uh, worked on it and and you know made it hopefully a little bit better. Um, and uh, you know, sort of the the idea that we can make tools for for people to to um, you know be better artists, right? By just painting kind of semantic with a semantic paintbrush, um, and that that was pretty cool. Um, one of the interesting things that we've gone on to do with that is actually for a product called um, Maxine. Uh, Nvidia is really interested in like making video conferencing better, like Zoom, for example, and um, it turns out that you know we think we can use this kind of technology to make uh, a better video compression method specifically designed for you know uh, compressing the video of my head <laughs> or your head. Uh, and the way that works is that instead of actually sending the video, we can do a key point extraction 
to kind of just find the key points on a person's face. And then we can just send the key points over the internet and use a neural network to do the resynthesis. Um, and you know that that can dramatically reduce the um, the network bandwidth that's required to um, to to do video conferencing. So we're we're excited about uh, you know that, and I think it's kind of an interesting example of how like the technology didn't change very much, you know, um, uh, from the original GoGAN of like okay, we're drawing semantic maps, and and then we're we're using that to build um, uh, to build a tool for artists uh, to. Uh, you know, of course, we we had to extend it. You know, to to work on videos um, with our video synthesis uh, work, and you know, further extend it to make it uh, especially suited for for this particular project. But um, you know, the applications of the same technology can be uh, pretty pretty widespread. You know, these comparisons on the left um, are at ISO bandwidth uh, with H.264 with um, the the um, conditional GAN based video compression on the right. Um, so that's that's kind of exciting, and you know, hopefully, hopefully, we're going to see like much better video conferencing powered by AI. Okay, um, I don't have very much time. I wanted to talk about systems work that we're doing with um, very large language models. So you guys know about GPT three. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about large language modeling is that we have been in an era where the compute complexity of training a neural network for for state of the art language models has been doubling every two months. Uh, since 2018. Now, doubling every two months is a very steep curve. At some point, we'll run out of you know money on planet Earth, uh, and that curve won't continue. So, um, so I don't want to give the impression that this is going to happen forever. But the reason that it has been happening is because it's tremendously valuable and very exciting to build these language models. But they're extraordinarily computationally intensive. So, to train uh, OpenAI's GPT-3 is approximately 430 zettaflops, which is about half of a yada flop. And I put the you know handy Wikipedia metric prefix here because I always get confused after we get past exa, uh, I kind of lose lose my train of thought here. Um, so it's a lot, right? It's an it's an extraordinary amount of compute, and that means it's a very interesting systems problem. We have built a framework for um, training the world's largest language models. We call it Megatron, named after the biggest, fattest transformer. Um, it's open source on GitHub, um, and uh, you know we. Uh, use it to train really huge language models at NVIDIA and other people at other companies use it too. Um, it is, has a lot of different optimizations for model parallelism, both for pipeline parallelism and, and tensor parallelism, where we're splitting the network by layer, and then we're splitting each layer up amongst multiple processors. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, through the details of how we do that. Um, uh, you know, pipelining is, is always fun because you have pipeline bubbles, and, and so you can have much smarter schedules that um, you know, have implications for communication, but can actually make things go faster. Um, and, um, you know, the, the upshot of all of this um, work that we've done in Megaton to have the most optimal GPU kernels, the most optimal pipeline parallelism schedules, uh, the most optimal tensor parallelism uh, communication uh, is that we are able to train very large language models at very high efficiency. So, um, you know, when training a one trillion parameter GPT-3 style model, for example, on uh, 3,000 of our A100 GPUs, we sustain 52% of their tensor core peak. So that's 163 teraflops per GPU that we're able to sustain over the entire application. So this is not just, you know, running forward prop or something like that. This is including everything, all communication, um, the data lo loaders and, and, and everything. Uh, and, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, a, a really great result um, that has been extraordinarily valuable, as I said, because uh, the compute demands for training these models are so high. Uh, and so, you know, um, you know, personally, I'm, I'm very excited about the applications of large language models. Um, I know there's a controversy about um, whether large language models are actually intelligent. Some people saying, uh, you know, recently that, that uh, they're, they're kind of like parrots. You know, I'm I'm not sure that I'm much better than a parrot myself. Uh, a lot of intelligence has to do with remembering things, and and um, you know, uh, there's days when when I feel like I would like to aspire to a, to parrot status. Um, so I'm I'm not sure that that we can resolve um, sort of uh, philosophical um, discussions about the nature of intelligence. But I think the applications of these large language models are are really extraordinary. Um, if they're deployed wisely, I think they will make the world a much better place. And I'm I'm really excited about. Um, the possibility to do that. And, um, you know, at NVIDIA, we're building a lot of products these days that uh, can take advantage of these language models, like um, our toolkits for conversational AI to help 
uh, companies around the world build their own conversational AI agents. Um, our user interface uh, for our for our car, our self self driving car work, you know, all powered by these language models. Um, personally, I'm really excited about gaming. You know, I think that there's going to be new kinds of gaming experiences. You guys may have heard of AI Dungeon which, um, you know, uses uh, GPT models to make a, a text adventure. But I think, you know, uh, that's just the beginning. Um, and like sort of the, the virtual experiences that people are going to have interacting with these language models are going to become really interesting and really fun. Um, and so, so you know, I'm, I'm really excited about these possibilities. So, okay, um, I think I'm with that, I'm out of time. And um, uh, so I just wanted to, to wrap up by, um, again, thanking you for giving me the opportunity to come talk about some of the work we're doing to apply deep learning at NVIDIA and especially, you know, focus on some of maybe the, the less appreciated aspects of what does it mean to apply deep learning, the uh, data, the application framing and the systems work that's required to really make products. Um, of course, the algorithms are fun too. And, and you know, we, we, we find benefits from, from new algorithms as well. But, but the other three, I think, really dominate industrial uh, applied deep learning. And, and um, so it's been fun for me to come and, and tell you about that today. And with that, um, I, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So I'll jump in here, Brian. Um, great talk, I re really enjoyed it. Um, I'm always interested in this. I, 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 we, we took to heart what you said. I think we all heard about that uh, maybe mo original model architecture design is a little overstated in academia. And I'm, but I'm always interested in the trade-offs between uh, model optimization and actual original model design. And so can you talk about some of the model optimizations that occurred between DOS 1.0 and 2.0? Did you use pruning, quantization, new library design? Yeah. Um, we didn't actually do very much. We did, we did actually, um, uh, we did reduce channel counts in some aspects of, of the neural network. Uh, so does that count as pruning? It's not really pruning because, you know, we, we didn't really keep the, the weights. We just trained models with reduced channel counts. Um, actually, most of the speed up that we got was not from the neural network itself. It was from the context in which we use the neural network. Like we found, we found ways to just ask the neural network to do less work, um, if that makes sense. And that dominated the, the actual compute time of the neural network itself. Then that plus um, uh, an enormous amount of hand-coded um, CUDA kernels <laughs> where we were, we were just paying really, really close attention to how the execution was going to proceed on, on the GPU itself and, and fusing as much as possible together so that we don't end up being bottlenecked by um, transferring data on and off the chip, but we keep you know, everything on chip as much as possible. That, that made a huge difference. Um, you know, so as far as like, you know, would we like to do more with pruning? Um, absolutely. It's on my list of things to do. Um, one of the things about Ampere that um, we announced last year that, that is, is, is really quite interesting is this sparse um, neural network instruction. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but essentially what it does is, um, you know, uh, allows you to run um, sparse neural networks at twice the rate of dense neural networks. And um, the sparsity patterns that it can accomplish, that it can accommodate are in this four to two style sparsity. So out of every group of four activations where the four activations are contiguous, um, you need to choose exactly, you know, zero, one or two of them to be active. Um, and, and if you, you know, and, and so that gives you a certain amount of flexibility, right? There's, there's, a, there's, there's quite a few different patterns in, in a group of four where you, you get to choose zero, one or two of them to be active, but, uh, but it is a certain amount of restriction. And you know that can actually um, run at twice the rate of a dense neural network um, on Ampere, uh, on our our GA our, our A100 GPU as as well as the RTX 3000 GPUs that are based on Ampere. Um, so that uh, that's a really interesting uh, thing that um, you know is on our list uh, to exploit, but we we haven't done that yet. Uh, basically, there's been some other things that um, have have been kind of dominant. Um, in, in just sort of the, the overall optimization of the entire application uh, that, that we, we needed to do first. But I hope we get there. Great, thanks. It looks like Eli has a question. Eli, do you want to speak up? Uh, yes, uh, I was very fascinated by the, um, it, what it, it looked at your chip layout example. And it looks like uh, you were using a generative adversarial network. And I was trying to think, what does, what does that mean? 
and it's it seems like you tr you try various uh, designs and you kind of see how they perform. Uh, how, how does it work? How, how do we think about it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, so this this is what we're talking about, right? This is this is yes. what your question's about. Okay. Yeah. So so um, what we're using is um, a particular approach to reinforcement learning called Q learning. And um, what the what the goal of Q learning is is for us to learn uh, a reward. Um, so so we're in a given state. So let's let's say we're starting at the bottom left here. So we're in a particular state. Our adder is is a particular shape. And um, there's lots of different things we could do to that adder. There's lots of different actions we could take. So we um, the the goal of the network is to score all of the different actions that we might take. Uh, and, and so the network is trying to learn, like, if I did this, uh, what is the anticipated reward that I would get? And then, of course, uh, you, so you, you, run, you run it through the network. The network predicts this is going to be my most profitable action. Then you take that action. Okay, so now we have a new circuit. And, and that, so we'll call that S of T plus 1. So we have our S of T that was before the action that was predicted by the network. We have the S of T plus 1, which is after the action that the network predicted. And then we, we run those both through circuit synthesis, uh, and that's going to give us area and delay for the adders. And now what we can do is we can compare those and see you know, what the area was for each of those uh, designs and what the delay was for each of the designs. And then we can use that to create a reward uh, that then uh, informs the training process for the Q network. And so um, over time, the Q network learns which actions are going to be most profitable for a given state of the design. Uh, now, it seems to me that that sounds like what a human being would do. A human designer would do the same thing. Um, uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, so, you know, reinforcement learning has, has been around for a long time. Q-learning has, has been around for a long time. So this is, this is not, we, d we did not invent, uh, by any means, we did not invent uh, this, this approach. But, um, you know, but it's, the nice thing about it is that it's compatible with, you know, um, things like circuit synthesis, right? So kicking off a circuit synthesis job uh, is a, a high latency uh, operation and it's completely non-differentiable, right? Like there's no way that we could build a differentiable approximation to a circuit synthesis library that would basically give us a, a, a thing that approximated the area and delay from circuit synthesis well enough that we train this in a supervised way, right? So, um, you know, Q learning allows us to, to learn uh, a, a particular um, uh, agent, you know, even though the the thing that's generating the the information about how well we did the scoring of, of our agent is happening by some process that's very slow and and very complicated and you know outside of our control, um, and so that's you know why why we um, we went about it this way. So Brian, let's try and sneak in a couple more questions. So Grace Din uh, had a question. Are you able to unmute yourself? Or... Um, I, I went ahead and unmuted her so she okay, should be able to ask. Grace, please go ahead. Um, hello, is this working? It is. Yeah. Okay, so generally, uh, this, is this is a question about sort of the earlier part of your, your, your talk when you were talking about, you know, you have all these complicated sort of applications and you were, trying to figure out how to map them onto sort of these kernels that you knew uh, how to do well. Um, so my question is, is this code generation? Is this actual code generation um, during runtime or compilation? Or is it just sort of like figuring out which sort of pre-computed kernel is the best for the job? And if you're actually doing code generation, uh, how do you deal with the performance penalty? And yeah. maybe sort of a higher level question is that generally, what is your approach towards uh, reconfigurability? Okay. Oh, great question. Um, so uh, in this case, we are not doing any code generation. This is just a kernel selection. So you can think of the library that's running these computations as a bag of like a thousand different implementations of matrix multiply. Um, and some of them are legal for a given problem, and some of them are not, right? Some of them may have constraints, like they only work if all of the dimensions are multiples of eight, for example. And you may have a problem where that's not the case. You know, so, so we, have, we have this list of a thousand different implementations. Some of them are feasible, some of them are not feasible. Um, we're gonna want to, to choose from that list of a thousand among the feasible ones, uh, which one we actually think is gonna be the fastest. Um, so we're not doing any runtime code generation here. 
Um, to your second question about like, how do we think about overheads? You know, again, like this is a really interesting problem because we're on kind of a, there's a zero sum game, right? That like the longer we spend picking the kernel that we're gonna run, uh, the less of a benefit we're going to get, right? So if, if our time to choose the right kernel was longer than the time it actually takes to run the kernel, we would actually slow down by spending all this time thinking about which one we should run. And so the heuristic needs to be pretty quick. Um, and we've done a lot of work um, to make it quick. There's a lot of um, caching and there's a lot of um, sort of, I guess, a cascade, right? So you, you probably heard of cascade classifiers where you, know, you don't necessarily have to run the whole classifier for every input because some things are really obvious what to do. And so if you know that something that's really obvious, then you just exit early. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, and then of course, we, we've also spent a lot of time uh, working on the, the execution time of this neural network itself. Uh, in this case, it's running on the CPU. We, we run this on the CPU before we launch the computation on the GPU. Uh, and um, so we, you know, we, we had to pay attention to, to making sure that uh, it was running at, you know, the, the fastest we could possibly get it uh, on the CPU in order to make this uh, profitable. And then, okay, so then the question about reconfigurability, what's, what's my approach to reconfigurability? Well, you know, NVIDIA uh, as a company, we believe in um, basically programmable processors. So um, our GPUs are, are programmable machines. Um, we, the way we reconfigure them is just by running a program. So we're not, we're not doing something like, um, you know, like an FPGA or something where there's like different um, uh, configurations we might want to load in there. Um, there's no like mode switching or anything that's, that's happening here. We're just uh, running different instruction streams and that's, that's uh, going to determine our, our speed. So maybe just one more, Brian. Um, I'm going to rephrase Amir Gulami's question here a little bit. So the way I put it is you showed us a lot of great work that you're doing. Can you tell us what we should be doing in particular? What should we be doing to uh, deploy uh, uh, neural networks for applications? What, what, are, what are some of the biggest problems that remain? <clears throat> okay, well, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, um, okay, problems that, that I think would be interesting for, for, um, for you guys to work on. Well, personally, I believe that um, real-time deep learning for computer graphics is completely open-ended. Um, very few people are working on it. I think it's a really interesting problem. Um, I think it's feasible. It's a feasible problem for for um, academics to work on. Of course, it requires um, some attention to be paid to um, execution costs of the neural network. But I think in a in a paper, you can hand wave a little bit of that away and just sort of say, you know, my model says this should be real time given enough uh, enough work. Um, but you know, uh, computer graphics is like a it's a it's a pretty important workload. It's economically important. It has a lot of societal implications and benefits. And um, you know, I, I feel like it there's there's very few people that are that are working on that. So that's something I'm personally really excited in and and hoping to see a lot a lot more progress. Um, I think that um, you know there's there's still a lot of questions about um, how we use uh, a lot of these uh, models. Um, that, that I think I'd love some help with. Um, sometimes with large language models, for example, there's, uh, there's accessibility concerns because just running these models, uh, even in inference can be, can be difficult. But I still think that um, there's a lot uh, to learn uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, students and academics that are working on, on these problems about how to, how to use neural networks. I think um, the questions about uh, fairness and bias and, and ethics relating to large language models are, are really good problems for academics to work on because they're really interdisciplinary and, and also require a lot of, um, uh, I guess, um, uh, thoughtful like analysis. Um, you know, it's, it's less, I think, like the, we, we aren't gonna solve those problems just by scaling things up industrially. We're gonna have to figure out, you know, more principled intellectual frameworks for, for thinking about them. So, so I think that's, that's pretty important. You know, Systems in general, right? So, so I, I talked about two systems project problems, right? One is this this library, you know, of like how do we make libraries better by using um, machine learning inside the library? I think that's that's pretty exciting, you know, and um, not too many people are doing that. But I think, uh, you know, and and by the way, this has been a dream of mine for a long time. I've 
I published a paper with some friends on this in 2014. Uh, and, and it wasn't until, you know, 2020 that we actually managed to deploy it. So it took six years uh, to go from an academic paper to a thing that, you know, actually we were able to deploy. Um, uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities in, in systems design in, in libraries. How do we make libraries more efficient using machine learning? I think um, also compilers, you know, um, you know, compilers are, you know, kind of a fundamental part of computer science. And what can we do with compilers uh, with, you know, very large language models, for example, uh, I, I feel like that's a really interesting problem. So I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic about applications uh, of deep learning, I guess, you know, that's, that's kind of my job, right, is, is to find, find new things to do with deep learning that are, that are going to be useful. And, and so like, I feel like we're still at the beginning, I feel like we're still kind of in an era where there's, you know, all these diamonds on the beach, like Kurt and I used to say, um, that are just waiting for somebody to try. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so I'm really optimistic about it. At the same time, I recognize that, you know, some things are better done industrially, especially things involving like very large scale um, work, you know, it's expensive, and it's probably better to do that um, at a company that that uh, can invest uh, a lot of resources into it. Um, so anyway, ho hopefully that helps. But uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a hard question. Uh, yeah, to come well, thank you very much. Agenda for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, and thank you for your talk, and I'll turn it back over to Eli and Eric. So thank you, everybody, uh, for coming, and uh, this is weekly, so uh, please uh, come uh, next week where we have another exciting uh, colloquium. Great. Thank you, everyone, and thank you so much for a great talk.